This is Vasu Sham, and I'm joined by Alex Atanasov this week. Hi, Alex. Hey, Vasu. Good to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. So today we're going to talk about physical models of associative memory. Uh, hopefully work our way up to some modern neural networks, which is uh, Alex's field of expertise. But uh, he didn't start there. So Alex, could you walk us through your uh, nonlinear path towards uh, the field of machine learning? Uh, sure, yeah, definitely, Vasu. I think we met both uh, one another back in 2016 when I was uh, working as a summer researcher back at uh, Perimeter, uh, Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, and you were there, I think, as a graduate student um, doing stuff uh, at the time on, I guess in 2016, you were probably working on like versions of uh, gravitational physics and quantum gravity still before you were doing the uh, the current uh, uh, conformal field theory stuff that you're doing now. And uh, yeah, so my background was uh, really like studying uh, theoretical physics and uh, pure mathematics at the time. In undergrad, I think I did frankly more pure mathematics than, than physics because Yale's uh, program for pure math was like very, very good. And uh, I, I messed around a lot with like representation theory and like um, trying to understand how it's like giving sort of like a motivation for a lot of like the principles of physics. And then for a while I worked on um, sort of aspects of quantum field theory and especially quantum field theories uh, near what we call their critical points, the conformal field theories. And I could talk a lot about that because that is itself a very fascinating and like area of study that appears all over the place, not just in fundamental physics, not just in statistical physics, but really like across like nature. Um, and so I was very motivated by like the study of universality and what it could say both for um, statistical systems and strongly interacting systems, but also for quantum gravity. And I did a little bit of work, uh, like a good amount of work on sort of pushing the boundaries of that and uh, studying what conformal field theory says for uh, gravitational theories in certain uh, situations and what it says for like the icing model and in other dimensions. And uh, I think um, one of my like motivations from the start has always been to sort of like take these like really deep insights of uh, high energy physics that people are really working on the cutting edge and sort of like bring it down to like understanding these complex strongly interacting systems. And for me, like the neural network is sort of like the premier example of that. And the Hopfield model, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about today is sort of like the characteristic example of um of 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 these neural networks at least it's the first example that's like um that's complicated enough and yet tractable enough that you could see like a very large wealth of just results and uh, interesting phenomena and so you know i i was eventually motivated to go back and like understand uh you know see how physicists have been studying these things both in the old days where you know the really the first strong results about the Hopfield network did come from uh, physicists using their ideas, using the ideas of disordered systems and using uh, things like the replica method or mean field theory to study uh, their capacity to learn, their capacity to store memories. Um, and lately, I mean, with the, all of the stuff that's happened in deep learning, there's been a huge reawakening of that and a lot of really good string theorists and a lot of good condensed matter theorists have sort of uh, made really um, great careers out of both um, designing new learning algorithms and also understanding systematically, uh, you know, the different limits of our existing learning algorithms. So, um, and again, I think that at first I was a little like unsure whether like physicists could really like contribute something to this field because it is a, after all, like classified as a field in computer science, but for something like deep learning, um, it, you know, you have all these bounds about like the worst case error that a neural network would have on new data. And often these bound, bounds are so weak because they're assuming certain things, uh, even when they work probabilistically, they assume certain things that just uh, nothing ever goes as bad as these algorithms assume. And so they can't really get like strong bounds. Whereas physics has this wonderful way of calculating average case uh, quantities for these like massive, large disordered systems. And it is useful to think of like neural networks as systems with a lot of independent um, components. So I, I got very excited by the fact that like physics was actually giving like learning curves that was like, that were matching algorithms super, super well. And that some insights from physics conceivably could really, really inform 
um, the way we think about deep learning and the way we design and understand deep learning uh, going down the line. So that's basically where I am now. And I've done a little bit of work on that and I'm learning a lot constantly. I'm still in graduate school. So I, uh, I'm, only, I'm only like, I don't know, I'm, I'm no expert, but I'm trying to get there. Well, as, as are we all, uh, <laughs> in whatever it is we do. But um, so just, just to clarify, you're now a graduate student in computer science or, or, or do you still count as a physics graduate student? How does that work? I'm definitely still a physics graduate student. And a lot of the people that are working on this stuff with me uh, came into the physics program entirely wanting to work on this stuff. So okay. there is a way to just do physics and be working on this. I mean, a lot of, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, a lot of the um, people that... Uh, have the oldest papers on this are just like professors of physics at various schools like John Hopfield and uh I think uh, yeah uh, so 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 it is like solidly like an area that you could just call physics from the start uh, nice. although one of the nice things is we get to talk to a lot of computer scientists and it's like maybe like one of the most interdisciplinary areas that, that that's out there okay oh that that's very that's very cool yeah cool so so that just sort of um Let's everyone know that our discussion shall be rooted in physics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Right, you don't, you don't need to know any computer science for this, and uh, yeah. I mean, hopefully, you don't know too much physics if we do this right. It helps, helps because um, so I certainly don't know any computer science. <laughs> but it, let's let's get to the topic at hand. So, physical models of associative memory, right? So, so what we're trying to do, and you've laid it out quite nicely, is is try to apply. Some of our intuitions from physics, particularly from many body physics, either of the statistical or quantum nature, uh, yeah. to a system of uh, simple units, the simple computing units that have uh, collective behaviors that yeah. can perform more complex computations. And presumably that's what our neurons are doing within our brain. Right. Yeah. So, so there's this there's this intuition that well, uh, what we have are some very simple computing units, um, neurons that have essentially a handful of states that they can access, and for all intents and purposes, let's say they're just two states, right? So they, they either fire or not, and their interactions are intricate enough that they can do such things as say store memories, right? so. This is this is like where we're trying what we're trying to build off of, and in particular, the sense that uh, a lot of neuroscience and even like everyday experience uh, gives us is that, unlike what happens in a computer chip, um, as in unlike how memories uh, are encoded into uh, circuits in our in our computers, here it's a notion of association that that kind of builds in memory into a sort of like dynamical some dynamical pattern of neuron activity right that, that that's kind of what it means to to remember something like i mean from everyday life you could say that well you you smell a certain kind of food and it takes you back to when you first ate it if it's not yeah. something that you commonly encounter but there was a more sort of uh, a sophisticated notion, uh, I guess, what they call synaptic plasticity uh, in neuroscience, which I think a big and important word to use is like the word distributed here. The fact right. that like you have like a lot of neurons and all of them are actually secretly playing a role in that full memory or like a huge fraction of them are playing right. a role in that full memory. Whereas in a computer, you might have only a very small number of the bits in your computer storing a given object. And if you corrupt enough of those bits like like enough like being like two or four it's going to be hard enough that they can't correct themselves anymore and recover the object whereas for the neural network you could actually flip or corrupt quite a lot of those uh neurons um and it can still like recover the memory so you can blur the memory you can like black right. out half of the image and yet the neural network can through a dynamical process recover it um, and, and just hurting one of the neurons doesn't hurt one of the pixels on your memory. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt one of the, it's not localized. It's really like distributed and neuroscientists even use the word holographic. Like it's holographically mm -hmm. actually, right. Yeah. Oh, I, that, that's I fascinating. 
Yeah, something that was very interesting to me is that uh, Jeff Hinton, who's like a huge figure in this field, the thing that really inspired him to go into neuroscience was when a friend of his showed him a hologram and how things were holographically encoded on like this like strip of, you know, material. And he was like, oh, that has to be what the brain is doing. That's always sort of been a motivation. for. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, some of our colleagues in the broader high energy physics world would have seen the same thing and uh, decided to ask a very different kind of question. But uh, that's that, that is a fun anecdote. Yeah, 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 <laughs> that, yeah. that the hologram decided to. to yeah, and know, it is. It, I mean, it's, it's qualitatively similar that you have like these strongly interacting systems that like talk like in a very, very like, you know, not like non short range way. And as a result of that, you have some sort of robustness and, and, you know, the word hologram sometimes shows up as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess what you're referring to here is the fact that there's a, um, there's a sort of practical pragmatic aspect for why these, these kinds of memories, these associative neuron based memories are, are more robust. Um, but I, I guess the, the initial motivation for studying them was just even a descriptive one, right? There, there, was, there was just this thing that people were observing within uh, living systems and they're trying to explain, okay, well, what's going on here, right? Like, why, why yeah. is it that you don't have some localized piece of the the brain in which you just store all your life's memories? And then, you know, if, uh, yeah. for whatever reason you yeah. got shook, that <laughs> your exactly. memory of the world didn't get taken right so i mean it was really hard for people to study you know these things in living systems especially early on it's still like you know getting like the fine-grained resolution that like we're so used to in like fundamental physics is like really really hard um right i think one of the earliest inspirations for uh all of this like field of neurocomputation did come from like a biological observation by um uh, I think we, it's called the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, which is mm -hmm. for, for us these days, like a very, very simple idea, but it's basically that uh, they were seeing these biological neurons and they saw that they had like these dendritic tree-like structures that were receiving signals from, from, from upstream. And then they were firing signals downstream. And it seemed to be that once they received enough signals from any of their, you know, branching um, fibers, their dendrites, they would uh, fire uh, downstream and they had a very simple model um, exactly exactly like this so this is an example of, uh, of a neuron that's receiving excitatory input mm -hmm. and so every single one of those x's is an input it's another it's electrical activity for example in biology from other neurons you know I say upstream that is before this neuron but there might not be an ordering and then all of them combine their effects together. They, they add up and it might be that some of them contribute more than others. So it's not just a sum, it might be a weighted sum. And that's really important. So X1 could be weighted more than X2 and X3 could be weighted more than both X1 and X2. And then X4, it looks like is inhibitory. So that's actually weighted negatively. And so you sum X1, maybe it's one X1 plus two X2 plus five X3 minus x4 or x tilde 4 you sum all of those and exactly you do a sum over j of xj uh uh of aj xj um you know and then you subtract the inhibitory parts and right. all of that is what we call the pre-activation of that neuron so it's the thing that decides whether we're going to what whether that neuron's going to fire or not fire and in the earliest models, it was really just a step function. It either fired or didn't fire. And so you would do something like a heaviside theta, just like a, you know, uh, either a zero or a negative one if the total input was less than some threshold theta. So yeah, capital theta is the heavy side. So it would be something like theta y minus, you can say y minus b or y minus uh, theta sometimes is the word for the threshold. Um, yeah, and so that threshold determines like how much input Put, uh, you need for this thing to fire. These mm -hmm. days, actually, it, it, for us in deep learning, the, the 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 idea is actually that having everything be differentiable is a really important thing because computing gradients is like the central goal. So this heavy side theta is not actually going to be useful in deep learning, and actually uh, might have been the reason why for a long time in deep learning, you know, people couldn't really get much further than like single layer networks because they just didn't have yeah. any idea how to carry signals back to update the weights. We can get into right, that later. Sure. So, so that's the optimization aspect. 
yes exactly. so so let's okay cool so uh, i just want to give credit to um my former colleague at the perimeter institute Giacomo Torlai, from whose uh, phd thesis i borrowed this image um great so, so we've gone over like the old mccullough and pitts uh neuron yeah and the simplest thing right the simplest thing so now okay what we want to build towards is uh the, the hop field and, and just for viewers like that capital yeah, sure. theta is a function that capital theta that vasu's written at the bottom line is a function right. that's uh that's the, like a step function it's zero for if the argument is less than is the argument is uh less than zero and it's one if the argument is greater than one right so, so here like zero. all of the neurons are either fired uh firing or not firing and zero is not firing and one is firing right so it's either zero or one depending on what y minus theta is exactly exactly sorry for that interruption please go on oh good yeah so um now let's let's sort of crawl our way towards uh more i don't know more more sophisticated ideas i guess yeah, so yeah, absolutely. let's let's jump into let's jump into the hopfield model so yeah. let's begin by i guess sketching out what it is as a um system as as a statistical system which is probably what most of our uh, viewers would be familiar with and then yeah. go let's go into what it might possibly have to say about this notion of uh, memory and why this way of storing memories is possibly robust and yeah. if we have time we'll also explain uh, how much these networks can store how much memory these networks yeah. can store exactly exactly uh, and so, so, and just to get like a sense of the history, this McCulloch Pitts neuron was sort of the first thing that people thought about in this field. It, it came around in 1943. And for a while, you know, with the advent of it was roughly when the digital computer was really being invented. So people like the old school people like von Neumann and Turing actually thought that like understanding like these neural network inspired models of computation would be just as valuable and even more valuable for understanding, you know, uh, cognitive tasks than than digital computers. And for a while, people started trying to program them, like trying to figure out like how they could correctly set the weights. And they were all trying to do it by hand. Um, you know, there are very famous like people in early machine learning theory, like Minsky. Um, and it wasn't like physicists very quickly hopped onto this. They started trying to study like ensembles of these things and even like continuum models of these uh, McCulloch and Pitts neurons as, as early as like the 1950s. Um, and uh, I, I guess before we go on to like the Hopfield network, one thing that preceded that is like the idea of the perceptron, which is really the first neural network with a lot of these uh, individual neurons, with maybe one of these McCulloch and Pitts neurons for every single input that you gave it. And they all fed downstream to a final output um, McCulloch and Pitts neuron. And so this um, perceptron that you could train by hand, uh, invented by Rosenblatt, was like the first machine in, in, in deep learning. And it came around like the 1960s. Um, and yeah, so it's exactly it's exactly the same picture uh, where you know each of the X1s go into like these. It, it, it is the same in effect like as like a version of the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. And, one the thing that Rosenblatt did is he designed a very specific learning algorithm that you could apply, and then the learning that the Rose that that the perceptron could learn from experience rather than being designed to solve a particular task by a human. So the idea right. that this machine could learn uh, was really exciting, and there was like a huge wave of excitement that was almost too big of a wave. But um, and then very quickly, some some people wrote books about the limitations of perceptrons, and this field really crashed and burned, and the entire field of neural computation um, uh, kind of crashed with it. Um, let's move well, on. We, to we like, should yeah. we should say that when we when we mean learning in these contexts, it means really that we're talking about how to adjust these these parameters, right? Yeah. So, so there is there is an optimal connectivity pattern which are encoded within these uh, w's which lets you do do a certain thing do a certain task right and yeah. learning is the um means by which these w's attain that optimal value so yeah let, let's let's move on because that that i think is the takeaway for what will apply in the hopfield situation as well exactly so it actually did not take very long for people to realize that you could reformulate this like McCulloch and Pitts neuron in terms of ideas that people had already studied quite extensively in physics, actually in terms of like 
spin systems and things like this. And this was actually before Hopfield. These were just people in the 50s, uh, Craig and Temperley and uh, others. Um, mm -hmm. And people actually had like really early on, they, they had these ideas about like memory is actually the hysteresis of like domain patterns in these statistical systems. Like this is right, like very right. quickly like caught on because like the theories in physics were super developed compared to like these theories in uh, neural computations. Um, but I think that, uh, that, that, that Hopfield was really like the person that like got a lot of credit because um, he took a very simple model um, that's almost like uh, it, it, some people describe it as like a tactical step backwards from biological realism, where you have a bunch of individual neurons and they have weights between one another and it's densely connected, let's say. So each neuron talks to every other neuron with some weight, but the weights are symmetric, which is not biologically reasonable. So, you know, there's just a WIJ that's equal from neuron I to neuron J and it's the same as WJI from neuron J to J neuron I. And by imposing the symmetry in the weight matrix, the, the weights between the neurons, Hopfield could rewrite this entire system in terms of an energy function. And he could prove that like learning rules, um, Hebbian learning rules, which we'll discuss soon, are actually consistently minimizing this energy function. And so that the minima of these energy functions, which are sort of the attractors that you arrive at under these dynamics are truly like, both robust and like you can study them using techniques from physics and using techniques from just optimization of energy landscapes. Indeed. So, so that is the proxy for memory in this, in this story. Yeah, exactly. Very exactly. cool. So yeah, you can take it away, Alex, at the screen yeah. share. Great. So, and let me just make sure my notation is consistent. So I will mention one book that's gonna be useful for uh, people that are just like broadly interested in this field. It's a very um, old school book, but the uh, I'm just gonna mention two books that uh, people will find. The first one is Intro to the Theory of uh, Neural Computation. And that uh, book is by um, John Hertz and two other uh, authors. The other one that if you're more of a, like a serious um, statistical uh, physicist or like someone that really has like a background in these like calculations that you would really enjoy is called the statistical physics. Maybe it was statistical mechanics of learning algorithms. And that's by uh, Engel, T. Engel, and uh, one other. So I'll just write at all for now. Hopefully no one gets mad at me for that. Um, cool. And that's a wonderful book. That's, that's really like a, if you want a hardcore, like, you know, book that shows you how much physics can really contribute to like understanding the perceptron, the hop field network, et cetera, like that's the book for you. So okay. what I'm going to talk about for a brief amount of time is just these hot field nets. So let me even like change color. So I'll scroll down. You can always like look at that later. So I'm going to talk about the hot field network. I might just drop that in the description, the names of the two. Great. Books. Yeah, yeah, please do. Because I'm going to definitely, especially from this first book, I'm going to take a little bit of inspiration as far as like the notation so that I'm like consistent with them. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, Let's see the Hopfield model. So the, 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 the network is pretty straightforward. So what you should picture, let's first do a picture. You have like N neurons, right? And they're connected to each other by weights. Weights are connections that are symmetric here. The Hopfield model is, you know, it's the Hopfield model because the connections are symmetric. They're densely connected. I, I don't know if I can draw dense connections very effectively. But you guys get you you know you get the idea that everything is connected to everything else, and I actually think I kind of got it. Um, so so um, yeah, everything is connected to everything else, um, and so you have like at each of these sites you have what's called the activity SI, and this is actually by analogy to what physicists call spin, and SI is a number that can either be plus one or minus one. 
it only has two options. And, um, and the weights, Wij, Wij connect Si and Sj. So Si and Sj are connected by Wij. And there's an update rule for this network that actually secretly makes it a dynamical system. And the update rule is that each SI is equal to, um, you take the sum over all J going into it, which is literally all the neurons. It's WIJ times SJ. You could have a bias term, but I'll ignore that for now. I don't think that's really important. I could have added a theta I here, but I'm just gonna for simplicity assume like there's no, there's no shift. Uh, and you take the um, sine function of that. And I don't mean sine like as in trigonometry, but I mean the sine function and the sine function of X, so you guys know, is equal to uh, plus one if uh, X is greater than one, is greater than zero, and minus one if X is less than zero. Just looks like this, where zero is here. Okay. These are the dynamics. So these are, these are, th this is a dynamical rule. And all of the SI are updated by this. And usually it's one, usually we update one SI at a time, update one SI at a time. And we call, this is called asynchronous updates. And this is actually by analogy, like in spin systems, you kind of, um, depending on like how much, um, the interactions of the spins around you, the spin might, if it's pointing down, but all of its neighbors are pointing up and the weights are positive, it might want to switch to point up. Now you can, excuse me, you can update all of them uh, together at the same time, but asynchronous updates are sort of like the simplest thing and like work for us. And you can update them in a random order or in order. Uh, there are all sorts of variations of the hop field network, just like there are all sorts of variations on the simple harmonic oscillator. I mean, uh, this thing is really like the right starting point for this field, either this or the perceptron. Right. And the goal, so what's the goal of the Hopfield network? What is the goal is to store a pattern. And what is a pattern? A pattern is a vector CI. And CI is, so CI is a vector is a vector in Rn. What is n? Well, Si, Si, as i runs from 1 to n, that describes the state of the neural network. There are, here we say there are n neurons. So Si is a vector that tells you the entire neural activity. It's a vector in Rn. So I can just write quickly, I can just write that S, or if I wrote bold-faced S, bold-faced S is a vector in Rn, uh, or, or an S with a vector hat on top of it. That is every single, the list of all the SIs. So I want to find a way to make the SI approach C dynamically. By, and what can I do? By changing the weights, by changing, or, or maybe by setting the weights, by setting the Wij. Well, so what do you think? Is this like clear what I'm sort of saying? Yeah, like, yeah. To set the WIJ in such a way that we learn like the right memory. And what does that mean? That means that this C needs to be sort of a fixed point of the update rule. So Great. C, if C is a fixed point, that means the update sort of stops. And what that means is that the sign of uh, sum over IJ of WIJ C J is just equal to C I. And there's sort Great. of an obvious candidate right away for what you might want to do for this pattern. And it's just to set W I J to be equal to C I C J. And we'll understand why that's like a really good idea and how this is secretly the Hebbian rule. And why will this work? Well, if I just look at what happens, I'll have sign sum over ij, or sorry, some, I'm sorry, this is just sum over j here, sum over j of wij, but that's just ci cj times cj. Now here's the thing, 
If Cj was just a random real number, this wouldn't simplify. But because Cj is just either plus or minus one, this thing simplifies to being uh, exactly um, sine of uh, sum over j of, you know, I can pull the Ci out there. The Cj, Cj is just Cj squared, and that's always one if Cj is plus or minus one. So I'm just summing one over here. So I can just write this as Cj uh, uh, is sine of, uh, you know, this sum just becomes n times Cj, and n will not affect the sine of Cj. So it'll, because Cj is just plus or minus one, this thing reduces back to Cj. Sometimes right. for convenience of normalization, we define the wij to be a one over n out front so that this sum uh, becomes actually, uh, you know, it becomes a little bit easier. You have a one over n here, you have a one over n here, and then you don't have this n here. But that doesn't actually affect whether it works or not. This overall scaling constant doesn't, doesn't affect things, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Great. So, so, so is, just to recap, well, yeah. so, so the, the, the idea is that neurons as we know them are relatively simple units, right? That they, they yeah. really are either firing or not. Exactly. And that's why we have this, this two state uh, variable that, that encodes them. That's why you can think exactly. of them as spins. Firing. Exactly. exactly. And we have a vector their connections. Yeah. And, and it, it's in their connect, like it's in their collective behavior that anything interesting happens. And that is encoded in essentially this, collection of all uh weights right so this collection exactly. of weight parameters exactly. and this learning rule i guess is is can be seen as maybe coming from some you know cleverly defined hamiltonian uh which is sort of driving this evolution yeah. um, and i want to stress and, that it's actually not this actually isn't really a so, learning rule it's an update it's the rule. update rule yeah yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, it's just, just i actually the haven't rule. given not, you a way yeah. to learn the weights i've sort of engineered them by hand and this is why people liked the hot field network is because you didn't need to come up with any fancy learning rule you just kind of right. know what the weights are uh through I this head principle right yeah. and, and, but but the but the ultimate idea is that in the in the sort of phase space of this uh many body system there are going to be some attractors exactly right? so, so there are going to be some configurations of all the spins where you you know if you're evolving the system under this update rule you're going to hit a fixed point yes and because these are fixed points they're robust under you know the sort of slight change if you kick the system a little bit off course it'll still find it'll still find the attractor exactly right? so, like so the th thing that's why I have in mind yeah. is that you have like these you know these different this the space of all possible uh of possible like vectors s and you have like this one pattern c and if you engineer the weights there's like some radius around c the the actual memory that you want to store the pattern you want to store or as long as you start from around there you will sort of be attracted and converged there so if you slightly perturb yes. it it'll still uh it'll still come back and this is in the space of like these binary vectors so it really is by analogy to like earlier ideas and in information theory and shannon's coding idea, you know, if you have random noise in your binary space, there's still an error correction algorithm that can correct these errors efficiently. It really does go back to information theory and neural networks interface quite beautifully with information theory. That, that, that's very nice. So for our purposes in this simple model, memories are these fixed points in the space of neuron configurations. Yes. Which uh, I guess they probably have to be, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> Given exactly. everything we know about how the brain works is probably what they are even in our, even in our yeah. heads. Yeah. So th that's, that's the sense in which there's this very simple spin model with yeah. these uh, sort of funny couplings that knows uh, or, or that can capture the essence of what it means to, to, to have a memory or to, you know, for something to be a memory exactly. and and yeah that's that, that's very neat that's very neat and uh this so so this trick where you cooked up the weights to be of a certain of a certain form right you, this trick you right mentioned here, sort of like the yeah. thing i didn't justify i you i showed you it was true but it's like where did i draw that from right so uh, i don't know if you wanted to go there but um you did mention the the term hebian yeah, and so maybe we should 
explain what it like what, what the intuition is there what what does it mean for this to be a hebian rule yeah yeah so i i said that this was hebian that's how you write it hebian and it's from donald heb from this uh work of his i think back in uh probably 1949 so around the time that uh these early ideas mcculloch and pitts etc uh were were coming out and uh you know what there's always like a a a sort of cliche phrase that people always give you when you ask what does hebian mean and i'm going to give it here because it is the thing that i think of and it's just that neurons that fire together wired together what does that mean it means that if the firing uh of given neurons is correlated then there's likely a positive weight linking them together and consequently if there's like uh if it's anti-correlated there's a negative weight and if it's uncorrelated there's zero weight linking them together it's a very naive but like biologically motivated idea of how these synapses should be learned, how what what uh, developmental psychologists and neuroscientists would call synaptic plasticity evolves is through when when the brain has neurons that are firing together, it strengthens those connections, and then when the neurons start not firing together, it um, it unstrengthens those connections. And one of the beautiful things about this rule is that this rule, so this is called Hebb's rule, which is basically just saying if SI and SJ are correlated, or I guess anti-correlated, whatever you want to say, then WIJ should be, you know, in this particular case, you know, positive. Like I can say correlated, respectively, anti-correlated, correlated, believe that's positive slash negative respectfully hopefully that's like co coherent from the way i wrote it um and the nice thing about this rule that actually all of deep learning since has sort of like wish you know a lot of neuroscientists could wish that we could go back to is that it really only cares about neuron i and neuron j and it updates this synaptic strength based off of only neuron i and only neuron j and so we call this something that physicists are used to like this word but it's means something a little different we call this a local learning rule and that's beautiful because that makes it biologically plausible so we also call it biologically plausible whereas you know if we one day talk about gradient descent you'll actually find that the weights are depending on very non-local information down the network and gradient information that like one could not imagine how a brain would be able to compute this without like symbolic differentiation libraries or something like that. But this is a really easy thing to compute. And other uh, learning algorithms like Boltzmann machines, et cetera, also make use of Hebb's rule. And, and, and there's a real elegance to it. It's a, it's a beautiful rule. And um, so that's Hebb's rule. And, and what that manifests itself is, is just saying that the WIJ the simplest way to like manifest Hebb's rule is just to say WIJ is proportional to the product of the patterns of activations between those respective neurons. And I'll just divide by one over N, but that one over N is sort of irrelevant. I didn't need to, it's just uh, uh, it's convention here. Um, that's Hebb's rule for a single pattern. And if you like, I can write it down now uh, for the general case, which is what the Hopfield network is really meant for, which is when you don't just want to store a single pattern in the hop field network, but you actually want to store several patterns at the same time. And please, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to define the notation here because this notation becomes sort of ubiquitous whenever statistical physicists like study a lot of learning algorithms. So I have n neurons and they have firing patterns SI. So SI, I ranges from one to n. So this is a vector in Rn. Now I don't want to store one pattern, but I have P patterns that I want to be able to remember. And these patterns, uh, uh, these patterns are CI, but there's also a mu index and mu runs from, uh, runs from one to P, the number of patterns. So that means I have P vectors, C mu, in R, you know, CMU is a vector in R 
n. These are patterns of activity. And usually uh, physicists are interested in the case where both n and p are large. So I could say that n, p are both going to infinity with n over p uh, fixed. I just wanted to mention that that's not going to be super crucial for like the, the the next few minutes, but this is like a very important sort of we're really interested in what what what's like an analogy to like a thermodynamic limit here. Right. So so by keeping n over p fixed, you want uh, to make it such that n is still larger than p. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I want to make okay. it so that yeah, and I really just want to study how many patterns can one store as a function of n. What's the largest number right. of stable patterns in like this uh, infinite n limit? Because that thermodynamic limit is in some sense the the first thing you might want to study. It's not interesting to ask how many patterns can you got store with one neuron. You can't really store many patterns at all. You can't even you know maybe you can store one pattern. There's nothing, there's there's no good Hamiltonian. There's no connections with one neuron. But with infinitely many neurons, you can all of a sudden like really start going into like these continuum pictures and mean field theories and all of the rich physics starts to apply. I mean, implicitly in all of physics, we're always taking this limit of n going to infinity and being like the number of sites going to infinity whenever we try to like apply field theoretic tools to study a system um, in, a, in a systematic way, exactly. But the important thing is that there's, even for P patterns, even for P patterns, there's still a learning rule. There's still like a proposed way to like assign these WIJs. And the rule is this, the WIJ, instead of being a product of just one of the patterns is a sum over all of the patterns of CI mu CJ mu, same pattern, same pattern. So Vasu, does that make sense? Would you like me to like sort of motivate that and explain like why this might be like a good idea of what to define the number of patterns as? No, I think you, you really should you really should explain this generalization. Yeah, this generalization. So this time it's still a Hebb's rule. It's still neurons that fire together, wire together. But I'm not just looking at that rule for one pattern, but I'm sort of trying to enforce that for every pattern at the same time. And the simplest thing you could try to do is just literally make this WIJ be equal to the sum of the correlations of individual patterns and sum that over all patterns uh, that you want to store. So it's just this sort of like naive linear ansatz for defining the weights. And one can show that this actually does define like, you know, this the energy function that you get from this as long as you don't have too many patterns, and we'll say what too many patterns means in a little bit, this really does give you um, the right energy minima. Like this really does give you the picture that we drew before in weight space. As long as your WIJ is this, that like you have these stable attractors exactly at the different, you know, uh, mm -hmm. patterns that you want right. to store. And you need so to presumably, Another way to motivate this choice is just to go through your argument for uh, why this. So if we take C to be the yeah. um, fixed point under the update rule uh, of That's S. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Then, so you want to say, right. So we might want to look at this, right? The sum over J of, is that what you're saying, Vasu? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so we should look at this and see what, what this looks like, right? Right. So, so now if you have P separate, um, fixed points, yeah. then you want this to apply in sort of P separate instances, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Probably just having the sum is the is the right way to do it. And you know, having this be like the so what, and let's matrix. like actually look at what that what that looks like for, for for our case. This might be the mathiest part of like so far. So I'm just gonna write it out and we'll see. So we want to look at like for a given pattern, let's say for pattern um uh for let's say we have we want to look at it for pattern C new, we want to look at sum over J of um, W I J C new. We want this to be equal to C new, right? What this actually ends up being is this ends up being the sign of uh, the sum over all J and then the sum over all mu of C I mu C J mu C J new. Does that make sense? What I just wrote? It looks a little 
complicated, but you can immediately recognize that this is literally just one of the contributions to WIJ, uh, the muth contribution of the various ones. And I think there's a one over n here because of how I've defined things. One over n, again, not super important, but I'm just putting it out there so you guys know. And uh, what people, what you can realize is I can split the sum inside the sine function in terms of uh, when mu is equal to nu and when mu is not equal to nu. So when mu is equal to nu, I have something really simple. I have, uh, so I have a one over n times the sum over j, uh, and here mu is equal to nu. So I just get ci, cj, mu, mu, cj, mu. And then I have plus a sum, hold on, plus a sum when mu is not equal to nu. J and then mu is not equal to nu of ci mu c j mu c j nu. All right, I'm gonna stop the math shortly because I know we don't wanna get too uh, bogged down. But the point is, as before, this is just one. Mm -hmm. And as before, I can pull this guy out of the sum. And so the first uh, term in the sine function is exactly what we hope for. It's exactly, um, and sorry, I actually want this to all be news, I realized, because uh, that's, the, that's the free variable. Right. This is exactly C uh, I nu. That's fine. But then there's this other term. And this term is like a little wonky and kind of involves like understanding how the products of the patterns are correlated with one another. It's sort of like a weird like three point structure. This term here. Mm -hmm. As long as this term is negligible, if this term goes as epsilon, then you know you're storing all the memories right. And this term is important enough that it actually has its own name. And uh, and, and the name of this uh, term is called the crosstalk. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's how much the things talk to one another across sites and across patterns. And as long as they're sufficiently decorrelated, there's enough room in the space to store more memories. And the study of this crosstalk uh, is like the, the bulk of sort of like the statistical approaches to this um, to the to the hop field model and uh so, so let's just like to quickly like big picture like what i want is i want whatever this term is whatever the term i've underlined in red is to not go opposite ci i knew i want this thing to be greater uh or to be to be uh only helping us and moving us in the direction of uh ci i knew so actually technically the definition of the crosstalk is the uh product of ci i knew um uh the product of ci nu with this other term with the sum over j and with mu not equal to nu over all complementary patterns of ci cj c j nu this is this is like a four point structure that actually tells me so this is what i what's called c uh i nu is defined to be that. So that's really the crosstalk tensor you can think of it as. And this is the thing that we really want uh, to be uh, to be bounded uh, below. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or equivalently, like, you know, you might want the negative of this. You want, like, if you, you add a negative sign, you really want ci nu to be strictly greater than one. That's, that's actually a uh, or you want, sorry, you want this to be strictly less than one. That's what, what allows you to not have the errors. And you can actually show the probability of an error in your learning, in your update rule, given those weights is equal to the probability that this crosstalk term C I knew is greater than one. So I'll stop the math here, but this is sort of like, now you're really getting into like the deep capacity calculations that you needed. And you can see how probability all of a sudden appears and being able to calculate probabilities of like these products of interacting things is like very, very um, useful. And you can use like sort of central limit theorem ansatz is to sort of bound and understand uh, and understand like the, 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 the maximum number of memories you can get as a function of n. And 
if you pull that analysis through just this naive analysis before doing all the fancy stuff with replica theory, et cetera, you can already get that the number of memories you can safely store goes to something like 0 0.15 times the number of neurons that you have. So this is like That's sort of interesting. the first most naive bound that you can do just from bounding this crosstalk term. And okay. this is early, early stuff in the theory of Hopfield networks before you get into like the fancy statistical physics, physics stuff. Nice, yeah. nice. So by central limit arguments, presumably you mean that you sort of recognize that one over n times this sum is somehow computing like a, an average or a covariance of some <laughs> some appropriately defined distribution. With exactly. The, this really is yeah. like a sum of like you have like n times p independent, assuming that the that this is this is really actually quite crucial. You need to assume right. that the memories that the c I, the c mu are i i d. Yes, yes. I, I deeper okay. newly random variables. And if you assume that, then you have the sum of n times p independent identically distributed random variables. And uh, you can you very quickly replace this by a Gaussian in the right way. Um, yep. And you can, you know, you, this is a binomial distribution. It's exactly a binomial distribution. You can calculate the variance. And I think you can show that the variance sigma squared goes as like p over n for this quantity. Mm -hmm. Then you can pull through the entire. Uh, the entire thing and you can uh you can get all of this in terms of like properties of the error function uh above i a see i see i see uh, error function of, nice. of something that depends on p over n so you get you know you get that to happen yeah cool yeah okay no that that that, that does sound like a very um reasonable assumption to make exactly and so, it's pretty straightforward you can get pretty far without like the fancy physics arguments uh just to understand sure. like Roughly, the probability of error uh, is going to be okay as long as you pick uh, p not too much larger than this fraction of n or two. Yeah. Uh huh. So, so now the thing that I found interesting that you mentioned, and it makes sense given the update rule, is that you want this crosstalk to go in the direction of uh, the original c, meaning that you want the sign to be the same, right? Exactly. Whereas, you know, naively, if I just had this picture of the phase space in mind, I would think, well, maybe I want that to just be zero. Like maybe I want to have completely like separated uh, yeah. little landscapes. Um, but I'm trying to piece together these two bits of information and see what it means from the perspective of this uh, energy landscape to say yeah. that you have multiple patterns that are... Uh, what are they po positively correlated <laughs> I yeah guess that's what they are yeah is, does that does that mean that they're really more like um you know that th th they're you know not necessarily non-degenerate uh sort of critical points of some uh, some appropriately defined um uh, height function or Right. What's the intuition there? If you say that they're positively correlated as opposed to being essentially <laughs> separate, right? They're just entirely yeah, I uncorrelated. Guess, right. So here's the thing. I've I've said that the patterns were drawn from these like large, like independent, they're independent and identically distributed, but they're not like, because of that, they will like, there will be some patterns that are going to be correlated just by luck mm -hmm. of the draw. If you have enough patterns, for sure, you're going to have patterns that are like super well correlated. One thing you could do is you could actually explicitly decorrelate the patterns ahead of time, something called whitening the patterns. I see. And that could help your capacity quite a bit. Okay. But if you just random patterns and you just wanted to study these random patterns explicitly, which is sort of like the naive first order thing you might want to do because of the correlations and the patterns. Um, and I think only because of correlations in patterns that go opposite the weights in a way that might ruin the Hebbian update rule. So that's where the sort of one-sidedness goes. Because of that, you can get like, um, I guess you can just like remove um, stable uh, attractors, uh, stable attractor. Fish I points. see, I see. Okay, so yeah. by whitening, like that, that sounds interesting. So is that yeah. just the same as um, doing a kind of, I don't know, QR decomposition over this this kind of matrix, sum j, c mu, j, c mu, j. So exactly. that I, 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 I look force at that. The I mu matrix, I could maybe call that a capital C tensor. And I think whitening, if I define it this way, and then whitening, I think is, uh, yeah, it's like if I did SVD, then I know this yeah. C tensor would be equal to like 
uh, USV transpose or something. And I replace S, I take S and I think I just turn it into the identity matrix. And then I get this nuke C is just this like orthogonal looking guy that's just like U V transpose. And all of the things have been like uncorrelated sort of magically. Right, right. So the, I see, I see what you're saying. So so there's there's that kind of basis change. But then yeah. again, you're saying that there's, you know, if you don't do this, th there is some meaning to those correlations ultimately, yeah. right? Like the... That, yeah. that that is like a true um aspect of this phenomenon that you can have patterns that are correlated that do you know aid in the convergence like convergence yeah. towards one is actually sort of like is aided in the same way as a convergence to the other right if you just look at yeah. this update rule they're then... correlated yeah sometimes sometimes they help convergence sometimes yeah right they often like because of the fact that they could hurt it it's like undesirable but there are fancier versions than whitening to like make hop field networks memorize uh these uh patterns uh and yes. and really the 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 right you know the 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 way if you really wanted a powerful hop field network to do it which people are realizing only quite recently is you actually completely change what the energy function is for the hop field network and we can talk about this maybe later or maybe even another video about like sort of the modern take on hop field networks and how that's interfacing with attention and all of these other um interesting oh, we'll uh, get there ideas yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there but for now, let's let's uh, maybe dive into what the energy is of even the the basic manifestation of the network that you've shown. Yeah, us that's so a far. great point. I guess I haven't actually defined the energy function itself, which is uh, right. Um, so, so let's just bring it all back home to to the Easing model, beautiful. I guess. Yeah, and and right. So I will say that if you right, if you uh, just like writing this thing that I wrote here, it is true. I'm just seeing the book uh, that I sometimes follow along like it is true that if you have this c uh mu j c nu j equals zero then you're like guaranteed you know by this orthogonality condition then you have that this crosstalk term c i nu or whatever is going to be equal to zero and you're going to be able to memorize all n and uh so if the patterns are orthogonal you can memorize as many patterns as you have neurons sort of by this orthogonalization that you're doing um yeah uh because uh really when you have like n orthogonal patterns sort of all states are stable for sort of trivial reasons and uh yeah there 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 are issues with that interpretation anyway so okay moving onwards to the energy it's actually a very simple thing that if you're a physicist it's sort of like the obvious thing from a spin system or from anything else the energy i'll call it h for hamiltonian of the hop field model is nothing more than the sum over ij of wij S I S J. It looks a lot like the energy for an icing model. If the W I Js were just, uh, you know, consistent with a lattice structure in a given dimension, or it looks so. This in certain limits, this looks like the icing model. If you had like the W I Js sort of giving you this lattice structure, or in another regime, if the W I Js just were drawn uh, randomly, which they're not for the Hopfield network, but if the WIJs really were just drawn randomly from some like uh, mean zero standard deviation J, uh, maybe J squared Gaussian, then you have something that's called the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. Uh, model. And that is uh, one of the early models of spin glasses that, you know, Parisi and others have studied pretty exhaustively. And that's sort of where like the very rich ideas of disordered systems come uh, right into play. Um, but the Hopfield model, keep in mind, the Hopfield model is sort of engineered to fit these patterns. And so the WIJs for the Hopfield model that we actually choose is that the, the thing that we showed before is the sum over uh the mu and the j sorry the sum over yeah the mu and the j of ci sorry uh sorry not it's just the sum over mu the wij is equal to just the sum over mu of ci cj mu mu this was uh and and there is a reason if you assume that these patterns are sort of drawn from 
random, you know, Bernoulli distributions, if the patterns that you want to, want to store are in some sense random, then there must be some like approximate relationship to the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model where there's also this randomness in the weights. And so it shouldn't be super surprising that like techniques to study this Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, which I'll, I'll again mention is what is called a spin glass. Techniques to study spin glasses uh, can be applied to like these hop field networks under the assumptions of of random patterns, yeah, or even correlated patterns. Actually, if you actually knew the exact correlation that the patterns were being drawn from, you could again use these uh, these ideas. So this thing, this energy, is sometimes called um, Hamiltonian by physicists. By dynamical systems people, it's called it's sometimes called a Lyapunov function. Yeah. Or, uh, or, or, and by machine learning people, it's called the loss or the objective function. So many words for one thing. Yeah. And Very cool. And just the, the, the biologists call it a fitness function, but that's, you know, we're going really <laughs> off the rails. But that's, yeah, well, we'll get there too at some yeah. point. Yeah. So if we're, thinking of this as the objective function, then does it follow that what we were calling the update rule will follow from, say, um, that minimizing this? Uh, yeah, exactly. So let's say, right. let's say I had like some state SI before the update. And then I update, maybe for, for simplicity, let's, uh, let's update, um, uh, let's update the i value. So let's say S is my uh, vector before the update. And then I say that the i value of s, which I'll call, you know, now it will be s prime, is going to be equal to the sine of the sum over j of w i j s j. This is exactly as we've done before. This is exactly the update rule I've written before. Then I'll have a new energy function. I'll call it h prime, which is given by, you know, negative one half uh, sum over i j of that s prime. So let's just see what the difference looks like. It's actually really quick to calculate what the difference looks like. So what you have is you have, um, so let's let's think about a, a clean way, clean way to do it. So there are two possibilities. So HI minus SJ has two possibilities. There are two things. If S prime I is equal to S I, that is if S I is unchanged, then nothing has changed and this is still equal to zero. Otherwise it has to have flipped. S prime I has to be equal to negative S I. Does that make sense? So this is the yeah, case. So this is just, right. So, so the, here we're just iterating the fact that S are these uh, spin variables to begin with. Exactly. And so the result, that's why the result of taking the sign of some linear operation on s is still going to be an s-like object <laughs> yes. right which yeah, is why yeah. the update rule works in the first place is because these are all uh, exactly. minus one or plus one okay cool exactly and so because uh because of that you know when i look at h prime the things that are really going to change the, the terms that are really going to matter are the places where that s prime i that is flipped interfaces with something that hasn't flipped it's not going to matter if i do s prime i with s prime i the only things that are going to matter so for the H prime, I have, uh, I'll just erase, you know, the things that are gonna matter here are gonna be sum over IJ, negative one half. Um, and it only matters, like I'll show you. Uh, so I is not equal to J of W I J uh, S prime I S J. So what I'm doing is, you know, this is J is not equal to the thing that's flipped here. If J was equal to the thing that's flipped, then I have a product of the thing that's flipped. It's two negatives uh, don't matter. And then the original, uh, the original guy is again like the only terms that are going to be able to cancel this is J not equal uh, J not equal to I of so this is the this is now H of W I J S I S J. This is, this is the sum that we want to really look at. And I can pull out, so what you'll notice is S prime I is just the negative of S I. So I can rewrite this and pull out the I. So sorry, this, uh, 
the sum that I care about is literally only, sorry, I should stress this isn't a double sum. I'm only summing over J not equal to I. Those are the things, uh, it's only a sum over J. So I'm gonna pull out an SI. Well, you can show that I pull out an uh, SI prime, which is the same as negative SI. So two negatives make a positive, two halves make a whole. And you can show that you get SI times the sum of J not equal to I of WIJ SJ. And then you can realize this as equal to uh, SI uh, sum over J WIJ SJ minus uh, WII, right? And so uh, the the thing that uh, is that right? Yeah, that's the full that's the full thing. I've subtracted the diagonal. Okay. Um, there are two things to appreciate. WII. This thing is just equal to one over n times uh, you know sum of ci ci mu where we're summing over mu but this is just the sum of squares of something so this wii the diagonals of the weights according to hebb's rule are always positive so this guy is always greater than zero so we're subtracting something that's always greater than zero so that part of the difference is always negative and then if we looked at this guy right here well because of the update rule we know this is the update rule and this this guy appears in the sum of the sign. We know that SI has to have the opposite sign of, of, of these guys because there was a spin flip. By the definition of there being a spin flip, we get that this guy has to be less than zero. And so you get two terms and thus you get that H prime minus H is always less than zero. Does that make sense? The, 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 the first term yeah. was because of the definition of why there was a spin flip, was because that sign function took us on the other side. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, this makes sense. And so this Very is nice. so, really the argument that this energy function is truly being minimized by the set of spin flips that were prescribed. Um, right. Yeah. I see. And in fact, you can safely omit this term if you wanted to, like, because this, like, things, even if you, like, remove the diagonal components or the self connections, uh, you can still, like, have this energy function work if you had, like, a rule where you zeroed out the diagonals of the weight matrix uh, if you wanted to. And people study whether that gives you better or slower, um, you know, convergence. This, these are still, like, old papers from, like, the 80s and 90s. We're still, like, mm -hmm, in, like, mm -hmm. the prehistory of this field, but, uh, but yeah. So that, that's where we are now. Very cool. Very cool. cool. So, so far we've had, uh, I guess, an overview of the basic model yeah. of, uh, of, of, I guess, associated memory. And then we've defined what the memories are in the context of that model. Exactly. We showed how the, um, they're the minima of uh, these energies appropriately defined. Right? So there, there's sort of like some energy landscape uh, and the minimum of those energy landscapes are the um, stable memories. And we showed how there's an update rule which uh, seeks them, right? So, exactly. so we have the, the basic workings here. And exactly. you told us, I guess, in brief that there's some argument about the capacity uh, of yeah. this, this model to store multiple memories and, and how many of them relative to the size of the model itself. Exactly. And in fact, one thing that I haven't mentioned, it's that for these models, there are actually many different notions of a capacity. Like you could ask, cool. like, how, how sure are you that you'll recover 99% of like most memories with high precision. How sure are you that you're going to recover every single memory with like very high precision, every single like digit of it? Um, there are sort of like different, different like strengths to what capacity could mean. It could be perfect mm -hmm. recall, it could be approximate recall. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so yeah. in the in the argument you had above, how yeah. are you to interpret that? The one with the one point five uh, the, the and... crosstalk. Yeah, yeah, so so this this crosstalk term bounding this is gonna give us insight into like a lot of different um, capacity questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in this particular case, uh, I'm studying sort of like uh, let me think about it actually. So uh, 
I think I'm choosing it so that, you know, I'm choosing it so that the probability of an error of a given thing is less than zero, like 1%. Mm -hmm. So I'm choosing it so that like P error is uh, less than 1%. So that could I still see. give you some errors in, in the patterns, um, but it's like sort of like an engineer's way of saying that things are robust. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Exactly. So, right. So, so now I guess one other question you can ask or one other thing you teased at is that there is a similarity between this system and like this is what I call glassy systems. Yes. Right? And um, you also mentioned uh, quite a few times that the replica method was useful uh, in exactly. various analyses. I mean, we know how they are, how it is useful in our analyses of disordered systems and exactly. glasses and statistical mechanics. So here, uh, this is just sort of, I guess, a physicist's um, line of inquiry. Yeah. What good will the replica method do you? <laughs> yeah, that's great. What can we so do with this? I think there's one final step that I need to, or one final piece that I need to introduce to these, um, to these networks before I can fully like motivate what the replica method is really going to do for you. And that piece is something uh, that every uh, physicist is sort of familiar with just from like the way I've set these up, but that I actually have not mentioned at all. Um, because what's really happening right now is that this system that I'm describing with these update rules is actually a system at zero temperature. Things are actually okay. converging to the minima unambiguously. Right. And what I could instead try to do is I could try to define a probability distribution over states that was given by, you know, e to the negative beta energy of that state divided by the appropriate partition function of this. And this beta function, or sorry, this beta variable, you know, has the interpretation of inverse temperature. I'm just assuming everyone's sort of familiar with basic statistical mechanics. And, you know, in the limit of beta going to infinity or as temperature goes to zero, what you get is that you, all of your states are gonna flow to the minimum energy configuration. And this update rule is really telling me, you know, if you run the update rule long enough, so if you run this update rule long enough, you're going to safely be sampling from these zero energy configurations. In other words, I've actually given you sort of like a Markov chain Monte Carlo method from sampling from a distribution. That distribution is the zero temperature uh, distribution of the Hopfield model. One thing right. you could do, and physicists do this all the time, but also computer scientists have started doing this quite a lot for problems in computational complexity and for all sorts of problems in learning is you could try to soften this is what a computer scientist would say or put it at finite temperature is what a physicist would say. And then there are still like dynamical ways to sample a hop field network using uh, I think globber dynamics or things like that at finite temperature. But it's also just a very useful way to like sort of look at like a spectrum of hop field models going from like the really hardcore like, you know, take the spins to flip only in the right directions of the patterns to something that's a little bit weaker. So um, I think I've written it exactly uh, as, as I can write. So you, you could say something like, you know, um, uh, SI, SI will equal plus one with probability. And then the probability will also depend on like the sign, like it'll, it'll still depend on like, the the um sum over the j's of w i j s j but uh and s i equals negative one with uh one minus p but that probability will be softened it'll actually be something that looks like a sigmoid uh one minus p um right and so uh you know, people study these spin systems all the time and uh, they're very useful because you can take averages of these spins at like a given temperature and these averages are much more well behaved at any beta than when beta is taken to infinity. And one can show that, you know, if I just looked at, um, you know, what is the average of SI um, or, or what is the average, one could actually ask something like, what is the average of um, 
uh, something like uh, sum over j of w i j s j. Well, then this is just equal to the sum over j w i j uh, s j average. And uh, one can actually show that you can use like a very naive like mean field theory type thing to show that this uh, the previous update rule, which was like this very sharp sine function, actually turns into like the self consistent equation that says that the hyperbolic tangent of this, um, you know, beta times w i j sum over j of w i j s j, uh, where s j is the average here is equal to the average value of SI. And I can like, you know, this, everything here is in the tench. And one can, I can leave you to show that as I take beta to infinity, as I take beta goes to infinity, this tench function becomes, tench of beta something becomes the sine function. So this, this softening turns that like very strict and harsh sign, which if you remember back, I was saying was one of the core issues with these early approaches to memory and learning was that the sine function was not differentiable it wasn't smooth it had all these issues as soon as i go to find a temperature that goes away the softening actually gives me a lot of flexibility i can actually solve these equations analytically rather than by like guessing which i would have to be doing for the sine function so right. this is uh I think this is like my motivation for why finite temperature might be good, even if you didn't care about doing physics, even if you just cared about like understanding the Hopfield model and understanding learning, finite temperature is sort of like always uh, a good idea. And you can draw like these, um, these interesting phase diagrams of like, as I vary the temperature, as I vary the temperature, you could look at what the average, um, you know, magnetization is in like these systems. And for a given spin, uh, you could actually show that there's sort of like a phase transition at a given temperature or for a given neuron. So it's actually, there, there's all of these analogies to like statistical systems uh, appear uh, just like they do for, for, um, uh, for magnetism. Right. So, so, so let's so linger on at. this. Yeah. Let's linger on this aspect of um, thinking about temperature as physicists for a moment yeah. and acknowledge yeah. that there's a real sort of, uh, key qualitative difference between having zero and non-zero temperature yeah. being that since the zero temperature um, gives a uh, distribution as you wrote down there is just a projector onto the ground state uh, yeah. of the system it's yeah. it's it's basically you, you you really don't you have a deterministic probability distribution so to speak right it's it's, it's sharply exactly. peaked exactly. um and so there, the picture is that of a system being driven into its uh, fixed points or sort of being driven towards the fixed points that are themselves minima of some energy function. Yes. Whereas once you have a finite temperature, you have yeah. instead the picture of the canonical ensemble. Yes. Right? So yes. at some temperature, you really have some fixed average energy. You can't really... You can't really assign a specific one. You can sort of assign like a like an average energy, and uh, you now aren't really talking about a specific point in phase space, as it were. I mean, you can talk about the uh, you can talk about probability densities within phase space, so to speak. Yeah. But it's it's much harder to to give concrete meaning to. <laughs> so, so now, I see that. In the mean field theory, it does happen that the self-consistent equation for the magnetization becomes the update rule. Yeah. But there, I guess one thing we've sort of dodged in all of this is the question of temporality in this, right? So, so you don't really, I mean, we just said, okay, we do this at whatever, we do this one at a time, whatever order we like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I'm purposefully like not talking about that, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe we don't want to go into those subtleties. But um, here, there's just no, um, like the, the sense of dynamics is somewhat removed from all of it because we're just at equilibrium. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, so, that's true. I mean, that's true. Yeah. So, right. so what is the sense in, so, so what are, like what are the memories now like are they still the same uh minima that we had in mind before or yeah, are they, they just, are 
Are they just typical states of this ensemble? So the memories are, it's interesting because, and I will get into this in a second about like what the memories become. A lot of the previous memories are still exactly the same minima for the new one as the previous, but there are some that just get completely like melted away by going to higher temperature. And they're actually, and I guess I'll mention this actually in like maybe a minute about um, what that actually means for the memories. I guess one thing that I want to stress is like, you know, even in the infinite, uh, in the zero temperature case, uh, you have, yes, you have this deterministic algorithm, but by the end of it, once it terminates, you're like sampling from a distribution still, and you're sampling from an equilibrium distribution. That equilibrium distribution is the set of minima alone. Um, you know, similarly for these, it's just like any Markov chain Monte Carlo, there's a burn-in period where you're not sampling from anything, and then you're sampling from the equilibrium distribution. So in both of those cases, you are sampling from an equilibrium distribution. But I guess you're right, like the update rule, the formal update rule has yeah. nothing to do with the equilibrium distribution. Right, it's really- right. So, I mean, uh, here, the, the, the self-consistency equation for the magnetization holds yeah. at equilibrium. Yeah. Right? That just tells you that, that in some sense always holds provided you're at the right distribution. Yeah. Um, now, if you wanted to think about this in Monte Carlo terms, you would say that actually, no, there's, there's actually some kind of stochastic dynamics that drives you to this equilibrium at very late times, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's interesting to see because now in the other case, you could say, well, I don't know, I have a dist deterministic distribution. I don't know whether the, the thing I started with, the way I initialized it is uh, satisfying this property, right? But let yeah. me just drive the system to its ground state. Yeah. Um, and here you could do the same thing, which is probably what you're saying when you say that this is like a softened version of the update rule, right? Yeah, you just yeah. say, I'm just going to keep tuning the average magnetism. Or I'm just going to keep tuning right. uh, the and maybe like I don't want to, I don't, maybe I don't want to exactly say that this self-consistent equation for the average value of the spin is the update rule I want to, but there are like versions of Glauber dynamics that for sure I will see. sample from the finite temperature distribution. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and so, so what we should be comparing is, is suppose we should be comparing like to like is we should be comparing the converged sort of like convert state of the Monte Carlo uh, process, so to speak in, in either case, right? We should be looking at the, uh, the, the equilibrium distribution and comparing it to the equilibrium distribution. Uh, either at zero and finite temperature, right? Yeah. So from that perspective, I would say that perhaps what it means to look at um, states or memories in this finite temperature case would be to look at typical states, right? Typical the, the the ones that I have the exp e, e to the power of entropy of. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Exactly, so, exactly. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so yeah. I, the, I see. So, so we go from. And I suppose that's also true in this uh, deterministic uh, distribution yeah, <laughs> in the zero yeah. temperature case. Those are the typical uh, states. Um, yeah, it's just I that you cannot define yeah, entropy. The thing about it is that the energy dictates everything and the entropy doesn't say anything anymore. Yeah, because there is no notion of it in that zero temperature. Yeah, you lose it. It's you, just you know, free, yeah. free energy loses it, exactly. Yeah, I see. So, yeah. so here though, you do have, I guess, some entropy. So it would be interesting yeah. to hear what is like, what is the net effect of that from the perspective of the original task of having these stable uh, memories encoded in our system? Yeah, I will say that something that happens that I actually haven't talked about at all is that I have told you that as long as P is less than N, you have like these, you know, your, your stable patterns are indeed uh, your CI, you you do recover, like, as long as P, you know, as long as P is less than that, like, zero point, you know, something that, like, goes, like, one four or one five N, um, you're going to have, like, all of these stable attractor states, your C mu's. Yeah. But you're also going to have, what I haven't mentioned, is you actually have, like, these spurious states that are also stable, and are just not what you're looking for. And you have like actually several types of spurious states. You have spurious states where you have like random flips of your original good memories. And you also have just like these glassy states. 
maybe I'll call them G tilde or something. And none of these states are like good to have. Like you really only want your stable states to be your memory states. Otherwise you just could converge to like, you're, you have more memories than you need. And some of them are literally like fake memories. And there's this idea that like a schematic, like sort of picture of the energy landscape is that you actually do have these minima here and your true minima really are like the, uh, you know, the actual memories that you care about, your Cs. But you also have some spurious minima in between in your energy landscape. And these spurious minima could be like spurious states, they could be glassy states. I, you know, in glassy systems, you can have all sorts of minima that aren't global minima, but are just local minima of the glassy system that like a zero temperature album, uh, algorithm could converge to and not escape because glassy systems are what physicists would say not ergodic. Um, and what actually happens is that, so this is when temperature is equal to zero, equivalently when beta is equal to infinity. When I take temperature to be large enough, you actually get this really beautiful melting of the states. Like they just go away and all that you're left with are your true genuine Cs. And uh, this is, uh, there's like a beautiful phase diagram for this that I might wanna like conclude with drawing before we you know go on to like sure, sure. Other, other things, which is basically that, um, you know, you have this notion of, uh, you know, of, you know, they, they draw it this way. So, so there are actually two order parameters for the Hopfield network. On one hand, you have the temperature. And on the other hand, you have this P over N quantity, which is sometimes defined as alpha. And you have that, um, uh, like, uh, let me, let me think about like the right way to say it. So, um, uh, right. So, um, as I vary, there's a region at small alpha and at small T that all of the memories are sort of stable and everything is good. And it's exactly the thing that I've drawn here. So this is this region is what I've drawn sort of both of these things are in this region. But actually, as I take T to be above a certain point in this region, it's actually advantageous for me because I lose all of the glassy states. I've sort of melted away the glassy states in this region. And I, I don't know if they actually meet at a triple point or if it's just sort of its own thing. So I'll like, just for simplicity, I'll like just draw it like this. And there's this region where you have like only pure memories and no glassy states in like this T alpha space. Um, and then of course you have like these regimes where you just have, you know, no memories at all, like it's sufficiently high temperature. There's no, there's no notion of like being able to memorize everything because there's just so much chaos in your dynamics or not chaos, but just thermal fluctuations that everything is completely destabilized. But um, the fact that you can separate these different phases, phases with spin glass states from uh, phases without spin glass states is really interesting. And another good motivation for this temperature parameter is you can really see the full phase diagram of the Hopfield model quite clearly. And it's a, it's a pretty rich phase diagram for something so simple. Yeah. That's very nice. Yeah. And it does, it does make sense that if you did want to have a temperature, then at us if you just turn it up to be high enough then you're going to have entropy domination and you're not going to see anything stable anymore you're exactly, going to exactly. Completely lose. but then having just enough of it probably like if not melts away these local minima which seems to be really cool uh yeah. at least allows one to have dynamics that would escape uh that minimum without too much effort exactly. uh, whereas if you're at a global minimum you probably say that okay i mean most kinds of deterministic dynamics or some stochastic dynamics will keep you there uh, yeah. for a little while. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. But you can really have like stochastic dynamics that like make the minima uh, not present, like really not a problem for you, right? The, yeah, the, yeah. The, minima, the uh, you know, the glassy minima. Yeah. Very cool, very so, cool. Yeah, and that's basically, I mean, that's a summary of the Hopfield model and its phase diagram. And we can, you know, time permitting, because I know uh, 
we could maybe also uh, pick this up again if you wanted to and like continue the video for extended for a little bit more. Um, but there, there are all sorts of sort of, I've really only talked about like the ancient history of this model. Right. There are a lot of like sort of different takes one can can go with it. Yeah. But also, if yeah, you well, questions let's, about yeah, no. So, so let's, let's table the rest of the discussion for a uh, future episode. So nice. Alex is committed to being a repeat guest. Uh, nice. Which which I had intended all along, but but maybe <laughs> let's let's save it for 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 future episodes since we don't have too much time left. Um, oh, I'll stop my share for a sec. Yeah, great. No, that, that that was that was very nice. So what we could mention is that there like there have been uh, developments since uh, Hopfield, uh, which you know I guess broadly now goes under the t- deep learning banner. Um, of specific kinds of algorithms and uh, models which uh, generalize this exact idea. And yeah, so maybe yeah. this could be like a teaser for what we want to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And- I mean, there's one thing that I just haven't talked about at all that's sort of like the bread and butter of deep learning, which is like the the idea of backpropagating uh, error signals and training deep neural networks using the gradients of these errors, which is like a very different learning rule and a very different sort of philosophy to learning than the Hopfield network. Right. But actually, one of the earliest sort of, um, I mean, you know, you you go forward and like, you know, these people were studying these Hopfield networks in the late 80s, early 90s. And then like, there was again, a sort of like a second winter on neural networks when kernel methods and uh, other ideas like support vector machines sort of started like appearing. But even things like kernel methods and support vector machines can actually be studied in a very similar way to the Hopfield network. Like there are these, there's a precise notion of what P over N means there. Like the, instead of memories, you have support vectors and you try to understand how many good support vectors you need to like generalize well on a data set. So people really did study this even in the neural networks community. But then, you know, um, some people might even say that before like the, the actual deep learning revolution happened in 2012, when, you know, these uh, GPUs caught up and all of these like old school ideas about backpropagation and convolutional networks started appearing. Uh, even in 2006, there was a huge amount of excitement in the machine learning community already around neural networks because of the ability of um, these uh, machines, these 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 learning algorithms called Boltzmann machines, which really do mm-hmm. come from the Hopfield paradigm and from the paradigm of like local updates and recurrent neural networks. Um, the ability of these Boltzmann machines not to just uh, to really achieve state of the art on like the data sets that they had at the time, which were much smaller than modern data sets. They were really like MNIST and things like this. But people got very excited that Boltzmann machines were all of a sudden like beating these kernel based methods. And um, and figuring out ways to train Boltzmann machines, which are actually very complicated by contrast uh, tools in deep learning compared to just neural networks, uh, was a huge endeavor for like several years. And uh, you know they did really well on like uh, certainly on like image classification, and image generation, and people applied them to, to all sorts of things, speech recognition. Uh, and, and ideas from Boltzmann machines are still like really important to us today. And the way they are trained where there's like a phase where you estimate the energy and then there's a phase where you estimate the partition function it goes back and forth is just particularly beautiful for physicists and for, uh, for statisticians and machine learning people, uh, generally. Um, so that's something I, I would be fun to talk about. And then just since then things have become a little bit almost simpler. Than, than these stories, but even right. so, like the the rules of statistical physics, uh, and especially the way you can study like very large neural networks using these ideas, have still been like are still like active and exciting research areas that people think about a lot. That's very cool. So, I mean, when you say that things got simpler since, do you mean that the um, uh, the NLP uh, transformer world is a little less? Well, it has its own intricacies, but it's it's a little uh, less heavy on the whole. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, generative I, I modeling say, and yeah, or rather, the way the generative modeling works is now pretty explicitly by computing gradients and updating them directly. Right. Like a lot of the fans, you, you stuff don't reframed in terms of like differentiable programming. So it's it almost loses some of its elegance, but also you have like this just universality of how powerful differentiable programs really can be. 
Right, right. And, and yeah, so I mean, I suppose we'll maybe explain what that even means at some point, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's, it, it really yeah. is a turn away from uh, these ideas where here where you're just kind of exploiting the physics of, of some spin systems. I mean, you're, you're really just exploiting um, thermodynamics almost <laughs> yeah. to give yourself this uh, very nice picture of having some some memories and so on. Whereas with differentiable programming, it's more a story of knowing what it is you want and yeah. then breaking it into a task of uh, approximating some compositional function, right? So yeah, exactly. That's some ansatz. So the, I, I guess, what I mean, you could say that well, nature figured that out for itself too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. yeah. In some way, and... <laughs> we don't really know how. We really don't know, like how if if it is computing gradients, how those things are really being effectively computed in um, yeah, yeah, in 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 a, in a brain. That's like a big open problem is to understand does yeah. the brain do anything like back propagation? There's been some really exciting like ideas recently, and also just the question of. You know the brain spikes we haven't talked about spiking at all because right understand spiking networks is just in general a very difficult and uh people have tried to think about it for a while but like what role does spiking have in like efficiency of information processing or the ability to compute gradients i mean these are all still like open questions that are like very exciting to at least to theorists like maybe right now to practitioners they're less interesting because what we have that works works really well but uh, right. I think a lot of people, even like the the people that you know were engineering the you know the machines that led to the deep learning revolution, are still like fascinated by what more is there to learn from the brain, or what other ways are there to process information beyond Indeed. just the standard tools. Yeah. Yeah, and, and essentially, there's that tension between what what you mentioned by saying at some point that the Hopfield network was sort of biologically plausible as opposed to this uh more standard neural network that uh that the uh average software engineer of today is <laughs> is training exactly. because of because of things we should probably get into maybe in a in a third iteration of this <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. Drag I mean, in some friends. that's the thing you can't even in two hours like even get past like the <laughs> 80s as far as like what people have done yeah uh, and and it is it, but, but what's fascinating is that there's some um sort of essentially coarse and simple nature of biology that we are just so skeptical that what we're now doing with modern artificial neural networks is capturing. I mean, we're happy yeah. with what they're doing, right? We're yeah. certainly very happy with them for other purposes. But when it comes to understanding uh, the brain, for instance, yeah. we feel like we're a little bit, a little bit far <laughs> from, exactly. from, from the exactly. mark. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I find that to be a very fascinating dichotomy and, and, and we should, we should also return to that at some point. So, yeah, I yeah, think anyway. that would be a very interesting thing to return to. Yeah. Because yeah. even though they are very far away from what the brain is doing, they still tell us some really interesting things about like the way information can be processed. And right. yeah, I mean, I do expect like, we'll, even within our lifetimes, we'll see some really beautiful convergence between these two fields that should hopefully like shed a lot of insight into, into both things. Yeah, yeah, and um, it would be great to to bear witness to that. So, yeah. well, I I'm cognizant of the fact that you have to run in a few minutes, Alex. So, uh, let's end our conversation for now. But thank you very much, and I look forward to having you on again. Thanks, Vasu. It's always a great pleasure to get to talk to you. <laughs> Likewise, and uh, yeah. So this is theoretically podcasting. If you like this, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, catch you later.